Hey everybody, exciting to see everybody in the chat. Place is blown up. Uh, very excited to do some last minute review with you guys here. Uh, this is my first stream and I'm not actually sure if the audio is even working. So give me a thumbs up if the audio is working. I'm assuming it is, but uh, I don't actually know how to, to know for sure. Um, OBS, tricky to work with. So um, I understand that we are gonna start out with a shout out to Russ. Russ, it's your birthday, maybe. Uh, someone, who is it? Uh, Chloe was saying that you've learned a lot. So want to give Russ a birthday shout out. Make sure that he is uh, appreciated on his birthday. And hopefully Russ, a five coming your way for your birthday. So super excited to do some review with you guys here. Like I said, uh, this is great because I'm I'm figuring out here uh, in the minutes leading up to eight. Audio is working. There's a delay on the chat, so uh, I probably sound like a boomer right now, telling you guys I'm going to share my screen or do this or that. Um, that's something I've definitely heard from um, other people. Uh, okay, now I can't tell. Oh, we got a troll in the chat telling me it's muted, but everybody else is saying it's working. All right, thanks. Those are like the students in class. You're like, hey, Mr. Smees, didn't you forget to pick up the homework? And you're like, oh, I did. And then, you know, everybody else is mad at him. So anyway, thank you for that, guys. Um, like I said, super excited to be here and review with you guys. I know it's coming up, you know, we're under 24 hours here. So what I want to do is keep it kind of light. Um, you're not going to learn every concept here. I'm not going to be able to keep up with every chat. It's flying by and it's on a delay. So I'll do my best to check out the chat and kind of respond to your questions. I'll try to leave some time at the end too. I have this plan from eight to nine. Um, I don't know, you know, that it's gonna take an hour to go through these top 10 kind of diagrams or ideas that I wanna go through. So I can try to leave some time for the end. Um, yeah, I don't know how easy it is to kick somebody. Didn't think I'd have to, but um, I guess you can do a timeout. There, we'll try that. Um, anyway, it's kind of like having Bloxy. Maybe your teachers use Bloxy. I love it. Maybe they don't. Um, anyway, we're going to get into this here in a second, but a couple things I want to touch base on here before we go. First of all, uh, stop treating soil like dirt. I've got my favorite ape shirt on for the review. Hopefully it gives you some, some soil knowledge here. And then apes versus everybody pin, make sure to follow apes versus everybody on Instagram, TikTok If you don't already, yes, this video will be uploaded after we're done with it tonight. So it will live on the web, you will have access to it, and that will be there for you. Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is try to set this up so I can manage the stream and the chat at the same time. So uh, we'll see if I can handle it. <laughs> like I said, first, first live stream here, and uh, John from Marco Learning was not lying when he said there is a million things happening during live stream. Anyway, check out Marco Learning too, lots of great resources. Um, so we are going to get into things here. I'm going to go through with you guys some diagrams that I think are super important. So this is an idea I got from a AP Human Geo teacher. And he says, you know, you're not going to cover every single piece of content the night before with 20 you know, hours to go for the exam or however many. Somebody here is taking it, you know, somewhere else where they're in like four hours. So we can't cover every every single concept here in an hour. But what we can do hopefully is make you a little more comfortable with some of the big diagrams, some of the major, major concepts uh, that you're likely to see on tomorrow's exam. And hopefully might even come up on an FRQ. So think how much better you feel about an FRQ if you saw the carbon cycle after we'd gone over here. So I'll stop blabbering and uh, we'll get into some content. So with the carbon cycle, you gotta know the word sequestration, it's big. Uh, it's gonna pop up on the exam somewhere likely, and it's a fancy word for storage. So what are some things that sequester carbon? Biomass, sediments, limestone, fossil fuels. Long-term storage uh, could be short-term storage if we're talking about um, biomass. Trees, of course, they sequester carbon. So sequestration, that is a scholarly word to use when you're talking about the carbon cycle. Where do we see it in this diagram? we see photosynthesis, taking carbon dioxide into biomass, storing it, uh, incorporating it into the tissue so it's not in the atmosphere. 
We also see it in marine sediments. So there's sediments that are being buried at the bottom of the ocean, eventually it becomes sedimentary rock like limestone or fossil fuels. And there we have sequestration as well. Then when we look at another term that students often mistake, it's dissolved carbon dioxide. So students will oftentimes say, oh yeah, the carbon dioxide, like it just goes into the water or it can move between water and atmosphere. But if you can just use the word dissolved, again, you're writing more scholarly here. You're using the, the real apes vocab you need to. Um, so write that carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean and it moves between ocean and atmosphere in direct exchange back and forth. Um, so that's a big concept to have down when we talk about the carbon cycle. Another one is decomposition. A lot of students forget that decomposition is part of the carbon cycle and it moves carbon typically from dead biomass back to the atmosphere. And then if you really want to write like a scholar, make sure to talk about the difference. Oh yes, thank you. The face is blocking the diagram. Yes, big, <laughs> big mistake there. The number of times that I recorded notes this year and my face was blocking the diagram in an important moment and then I couldn't use the video uh, was brutal. So I'm so glad I looked at the chat. Who was that? Um, Krish, Krish, MVP of the live stream so far. Uh, <laughs> all right, that's just funny because it happened so many times to me this year. So decomposition, right? It's moving carbon from biomass back to the atmosphere. Now that could be aerobic decomposition. That's in the presence of oxygen. And that's where the oxygen in CO2 comes from. CO2, aerobic decomposition. Methane, CH4, anaerobic decomposition. So that's going to send carbon back to the atmosphere. Uh, again, done by decomposition, done by microbes, bacteria, but without high oxygen levels. Yes, definitely. I should upgrade to a green screen at some point. Um, but teacher budget, you know, we're working with what we got right now. Um, I know the webcam needs to be upgraded as well. So hopefully now that I have that tuned in, I can make sure to, to move things around. Oh, did I actually? Oh, it doesn't seem like it's actually moving. Um, <laughs> All right, let me see if I can uh, figure out how to move the document camera real quick. I don't know that I actually can figure this out as easy as I thought. It's changing in the preview, but not in the program. So we'll see. That might be uh, a fatal flaw here. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> we may just have to go forward uh, with the document camera there. Transition. Mr. Randall carrying the chat. Yeah, Mr. Randall or Miss Randall. Yes. Pick up. Uh, <laughs> this is great. It's like when a teacher has to go to the bathroom and another teacher steps into their classroom. Um, so I can move it in the preview in OBS, but I don't know how to actually change it, uh, unfortunately. In the program, what I need to so. We're probably just going to have to move forward here. Anyway, uh, with biodiversity here, we have ecosystem diversity and species diversity and genetic diversity. And so with these types of diversity, um, what you want to know is that it really elevates your FRQ writing when you can write about one of the three types. And so, you know, ecosystem diversity, how different ecosystems exist in an area, species diversity, you know, how many different species are represented, whether that's richness or evenness, how evenly the members are distributed. Uh, and then you also have genetic diversity. So just all of the different traits that organisms can have. Another big issue, which is luckily not covered by my head, <laughs> is this idea of how does high biodiversity actually protect an ecosystem? Um, and 
here's a great example. If you have a potato crop and the uh, potatoes are all of the same species, if they're cloned, if they're GMOs, they are not going to be as resilient in the face of blight, in the face of this disease here that's come and wiped them all out. Then if you have really diverse potatoes with a bunch of different traits and characteristics, uh, then they're able to survive and they're able to you know, repopulate after that blight hits. So actually pointing out why biodiversity matters is really critical. And again, fortunately not covered by my head. Um, yeah, I'll play around with OBS a little bit more, but I don't know that I'm gonna be able to uh, figure this one out. Oh, good. We got lucky again. <laughs> the head's not covering something important. Um, hey, kids, stay in school. Twitch streaming, uh, Twitch streaming is harder than it looks. I promise. Uh, <laughs> take it from an eighth teacher. So in this demographic theory of transition here, really, really important to pay attention to a couple things. What's happening to birth rate as human populations change and what's happening uh, to the population size. And somebody came up with a great idea, which is share these slides. Of course, um, I can share the slides. That way you can see what's behind my head and we'll uh, remove that mystery. So uh, if you give me a second here, unfortunately, this poor little HP laptop just uh, cannot handle <laughs> streaming and posting and everything. So um, there is the Google Doc. Hopefully that works. I think it's set to share with everybody. Let's just double check that. I'll try to catch up on the chat too in a minute here. I didn't anticipate, you know, banning people, but I guess if people are, um, you know, being obnoxious. All right. Try clicking the transition button in OBS. Oh, Lewis, great. Let's try it. Oh my gosh. All right. Everybody clap for uh, Lewis. Lewis Gear, second MVP of the live stream. Never mind. I guess Twitch streaming is easier. Forget it, the apes exam and everybody be Twitch streamer. Um, boy, I'm really, uh, yeah, the, the, the boomer comparisons just continue to roll on here. Um, that's so clutch though, that somebody just knows exactly what to do with OBS. I love that. Okay. So we now have, we now have the ability to move around. Oh, look out folks. Game over. Okay. So back to the demographic theory of transition here. Um, I did not think that I would be learning as much as I have already tonight. So thank you guys. Um, yes, Lewis, the goat genius. So let's go through the stages here. You've got pre-industrial, right? That is a country that has a really high birth rate, really high death rate. Um, this is a nation that's going to have low access to healthcare, low access to improved drinking water. A lot of people are dying, but a lot of people are also being born. And then another reason that birth rate is so high is infant mortality. So parents are having what's called replacement children. Now in stage one, if we look at this pyramid, it's a super basically like scrunched in pyramid almost. Look at the change in this pyramid from the base up even just to the 15 age cohort here in this stage one population pyramid. It's dramatically pinching in and that's because of infant mortality. You're losing a lot of infants who are not making it to you know childhood. And that's a big reason that you don't really have population growth. You get into stage two, now we have explosive population growth because a country is industrializing, they are starting to develop, they get clean access, uh, they get access to clean water, healthcare, antibiotics. So the death rate drops dramatically, but the birth rate stays high. Women are still lacking a lot of education um, opportunities and career opportunities. Uh, children are likely still needed as labor, and so birth rate stays high. Then we get to stage three. This is a little bit more developed. This is like the United States um, and a lot of Europe is stage three. Now the birth rate starts to fall as women become more educated. They're able to go uh, into the workforce more. They're able to pursue higher education and there's just more affluence. So countries and families don't need to have as many children. It doesn't really provide economic security the way that it used to in an agrarian society. And so now that birth rate is dropping closer to death rate and population growth 
is going up. It's growing, but it's it's stabilizing. I like to remember stage three is like a house. Um, people in stage three, you know, are more likely to be living in a nice home. And so their population pyramid looks like a home. Um, oh yeah, slides got just like bumped way up. I wonder if I can pin them. Let's see if I figure it out. Oh, look at that. Message is pinned. There you go. Got the slides now. So we get to stage four, and now the country is a highly developed country. And so it's almost like post-industrial. So this is like Japan, Germany. People are so affluent. They're spending so much more time traveling, pursuing higher education, focused on careers. They have so few children that they may actually begin to decline as a country eventually. So there's the theory of demographic transition. All right. Let's go on now to the most important topic of the night. Not really, but it's up there. Soil. So when we talk about soil, we want to understand a few different things. First of all, we need to understand that we should stop treating it like dirt. Uh, soil is a wonderful, wonderful medium for plant growth. It's a habitat for countless organisms. Um, filters water, so it's going to clean and purify our water for us. It's going to recycle nutrients. It can sequester carbon. Soil is essential to life on Earth. Uh, and so stop calling it dirt. You're doing a disservice when you call it dirt. And if you're a true ape student, you know the difference between soil and dirt. Uh, so let's go past some of the benefits of soil here, why we should call it soil because of how wonderful it is, and go into sand, silt, and clay. Sand, silt, and clay are the three particles that make up soil. And it's important to understand this because uh, it changes the characteristics that soil has. So when there's a lot of sand in the soil, look at how far apart those particles are. They're so big that they can't pack really tightly together. That's going to mean that a lot of water and a lot of air can enter that soil. Now that can be beneficial because the water is needed by the plant for growth, of course, but so is oxygen needed by the roots of the plant. And so some sand is beneficial, but if it's super sandy, that water just drains right through. Then we have silt, which is kind of in the middle. Then we have clay, which is the smallest particle by far. Because it's small, it stacks together almost like bricks. That's going to leave not a lot of pore space. It's going to really trap water and not let it infiltrate or trickle through the soil. Now, ideally, you get what's called a loam soil for plant growth. That is a nice mixture of 40% sand, 40% silt. 20% clay. Now, why is it beneficial to have all of those? It's kind of like Goldilocks, right? <laughs> you don't want too much clay in your soil. If you have too much clay, the roots can't grow. It's too packed and the water just builds up and it can actually drown the roots or the water can't even infiltrate to begin with. But if you have too little clay and it's too sandy, the water just flows right through. It's not going to hold nutrients. And so that's a big problem as well. And so a nice Goldilocks mix a 40% sand, 40% silt, 20% clay is a great example. If you have to read a scientific uh, soil diagram here, really helpful to just remember that you basically are drawing a peace sign on the diagram. I like to start at the bottom with sand and go up on a diagonal. Then whenever I hit the point uh, where the line that's running straight across from clay hits, then I know I need to go up and basically form, you know, like a peace sign there in the soil triangle. So if you're hit with a soil triangle, Make sure you follow those steps and then make sure it adds up to 100. Obviously, you can't have higher than 100% of your different particles. So um, important topic there. All right, now we'll talk about urban runoff here. And let's resize our camera. Uh, oh. All right, I'm gonna take a, take a second to try to catch up on the chat too here a second. Yes, dirt is a bad word, definitely. Uh, soil is darker than dirt. That is how you tell the difference. Um, water logging is when the roots become drowned. Correct. Good job, Jordan. Um, all right. Dirt is a dirty word. Yes, it's officially a cuss. It's, it's an ape's swear. Don't say it. So um, moving on from dirt and soil, which you call it, we have urban runoff. Big, um, important topic here. So urban runoff happens when rainwater falls on pavement, concrete, an impervious surface. That word impervious is a really good word to have down. So if you take a look at this upper right-hand diagram here, 
um, it's going to really help you understand why does paving an area, why does building it up with concrete and asphalt, why does that decrease the infiltration? Why does that lead to more runoff? It's because it's impervious. So that water can't sink into the pavement. Instead, it runs off. So in a natural ecosystem, we might have 10% runoff, you know, 50% infiltration. In a built up ecosystem, though, with impervious surface, we're getting more like 55% runoff, and we're not getting very much infiltration. Why is that a problem? Let's look at the big diagram here. Um, it's a cartoon, it looks kind of goofy, but it's a great example of just how many pollutants can enter ways as a result of stormwater runoff. So the trick here is that pesticide, gasoline, nutrients, you know, sediments from, from a construction project, motor oil, things that drip down from your car, anything that's on the cement ends up in our waterways via our storm drains. We have storm drains that have to drain the parking lots because we can't flood our parking lots, but it carries all of those pollutants into rivers and streams and eventually goes into habitats like the Chesapeake Bay. And you can see that's going to create an ecological issue here for crabs, fish, storks, you know, things like that. Uh, and so that's a problem. One of my favorite solutions is permeable pavement. It's super cool. Um, if you've never seen a video of permeable pavement or what some people call thirsty pavement, um, which I feel like kind of sounds like a mumble rapper name, like imagine someone being like, yeah, this young thirsty pavement. Um, I, I just feel like that'd be a great mumble rapper name. But anyway, Go look up a video of permeable pavement if you have never seen it before. Uh, there's videos of huge amounts of water being dumped on it and the water basically just disappearing. Um, it's really amazing. So it has a bunch of basically holes. It's, it's porous and it lets the water seep in and infiltrate and, you know, go down and, you know, basically recharge the groundwater as opposed to running off. So super beneficial. <laughs> Um, so Eric asked a good question. I want to stop for a second. Storm drains are bad. Um, they're necessary. If we didn't have storm drains, we would flood our parking lots. We'd flood our neighborhoods, but they create issues by carrying the pollutants off of our pavement and off of our concrete. So that's where the permeable pavement comes in and can hopefully let it infiltrate the soil instead of going into waterways. Um, so there we go. Um, yeah, young thirsty pavement slaps. That would be um, the the hottest H rapper around. So if anybody's got a SoundCloud, you know, young thirsty pavement is probably a name you can use still. I don't think anybody has it, so it's all you. All right, let's uh, resize here on our fossil fuel diagram. Ooh, okay, so really important diagram here. Um, the reason I love this diagram is because it reminds us that the steps for generating electricity are pretty much the same if we're talking about burning anything. So we can burn wood, biomass, we can burn trash, we can burn oil, we can burn methane or natural gas, pretty much anything that you can light on fire, you can turn into electricity. And the process is heat. That heat turns water into steam. That steam is forced through a turbine. That turbine powers or spins. And then that powers an electrical generator. And that generator produces an electrical current. If you want to put types of energy with this, we're going from kinetic energy of water flowing as steam. Same issue with a dam. Water as kinetic energy. Mechanical energy of the turbine blades spinning transferred by the generator to electrical energy. So those are just some great vocab words that you can slot into this description of generating electricity, and it can really up your writing on FRQs. Another thing you can do here, though, is you can take out heat and water into steam. Basically, any process that turns a turbine can create electricity. This could be geothermal heat from the Earth's core. It could be a wind turbine. Um, it could be a dam. It could be tidal energy. So this whole turbine generator electricity sequence is virtually the same for almost all types of electricity. And one of the few exceptions is solar electricity. Um, you should just know that you know PV cells or photovoltaic cells have semiconductors. They can directly turn sunlight into electricity. Ooh, uh, polar jet stream. We're not gonna get into polar jet stream here, but video 9.5 part two, about halfway through and it'll take you through everything you need to know about the polar jet stream. All right, 
Now we are on to fracking and tar sands. And I wanted to throw these diagrams in here because questions about how different fossil fuels are extracted are, are huge. They're really important. And so these are both helpful diagrams. I think that could really help you go through and remember how do we frack natural gas? What are some of the problems with it? What's the process? And then how do we get um, bitumen extracted from tar sands? And that's of course gonna be, you know, kind of a crude form of oil, but it can be refined to create oil, but super water intensive. So you wanna remember um, with both of these methods of extracting fossil fuels, they are super water intensive. So in fracking, we're gonna pipe down fluid at a really high speed, really high pressure. It's gonna crack the rock in this uh, horizontal portion of the pipe. So they've already drilled down, they've shot out a perforating gun, which makes these holes. The fluid is pumped in at really high pressures. It fractures the rock or cracks it, hence the name fracking. And now the natural gas can flow out with the water. Some big issues here though, increased seismic activity. We can trigger earthquakes, um, just ask Oklahoma. The data on the increase in Oklahoma seismic activity that coincides with the beginning of fracking there is uh, pretty alarming. And so a definite possibility that there's seismic activity. We can also have groundwater contamination if the well blows out. We can also have groundwater contamination if the storage sites that are storing this flow back fluid, this slick water on land leak, and then the fluid gets into you know, areas of water. Um, so um, I keep forgetting to look over at the chat every once in a while. Uh, this is wild. Um, all right, now we're gonna go into, um, oh, actually we're gonna go back uh, because we didn't talk about uh, tar sands. So tar sands are a really important uh, environmental issue to be aware of because as we run low on crude oil, on petroleum, what happens is we increasingly start to go look for more obscure forms of oil. And so we start exploring, you know, Alberta, Canada is probably the number one region on earth when it comes to tar sands extraction. And we have to pipe down this super hot water into this, you know, bitumen deposit. And bitumen is a super sticky, just like thick, viscous. It's kind of like molasses. Picture like, you know, petroleum molasses. And so we have to inject this steam to kind of melt it down so it actually flows out of the pipe. Um, and then it's going to be processed further with more steam and more water to kind of cleanse it, refine it into petroleum. So um, let's take let's take a second to look at the chat because it's it's going crazy and I keep forgetting uh, to look. Over. Doesn't fracking create another non-renewable energy source like petroleum or something? Yeah, the fracking is to get natural gas, and so we want that natural gas for usually electricity generation. It's becoming you know it's it's catching up with coal is the biggest form of electricity generation, but it's also heating a lot of homes. And so that's the reason that uh, we're pursuing more and more natural gas deposits, uh, you know, through fracking. So let's take a couple look, uh, look at some more of the chat here. Petroleum is crude oil, I think, and it gets refined in oil. Yeah, you're spot on. Petroleum and crude oil are the same thing. It's going to be refined. And that process is basically called distal um, or fractional distillation. So you're going to heat the oil up, uh, the crude oil, and it's going to separate into all these different densities. And that's where we get a lot of the products like plastic or, you know, the gasoline that we put in our vehicles. And so that's what's done with the crude oil or petroleum after it's been worked up. Um, what's a flow of tar sands again? Or a flaw? Well, a flaw is super water intensive. Um, it's also, you know, very carbon emitting. It's going to require a lot of habitat destruction, fragmentation to clear the land, to get at the tar sands. Um, oh, gamer, do you play Among Us? I have played before um, and it's fun, but uh, I don't know, I'm not a very good liar. I'm not very good at, you know, deceiving people in the, in the chats. Um, let's see here. Keystone, more like key to killing our earth. Yeah, Keystone Pipeline. Um, we should be talking about Keystone species here, not the Keystone pipeline. Yeah, I don't want to get political because it is AP environmental science. Um, you can probably guess how I feel about the environment. Obviously, big proponent of environmentalism and caring for the earth. 
but your test is going to be about environmental science. So we do want to stick to how do these processes work. Um, but there are obviously a lot of drawbacks of fossil fuels and we need to be able to write about them. So um, great point there. Uh, which of these two are more expensive? Um, great question. I don't know. And I don't think you really need to know which one is more expensive. Um, they're both very expensive. They're both uh, you know, I, I should say they're expensive relative to like cheap surface coal mining or the oil deposits we already have. A, a big thing to know here is that we're going after these natural gas deposits and these tar sands deposits because we're running low on other reserves. And so here's a big drawback of fossil fuels. Um, all right, hold on. This Dimitri guy with the pound, he's got to go. All right, chat's moving too fast. Too fast. The chat is moving too fast. Let's see. I put him in a timeout. All right. All right, sorry if I just put somebody else in timeout. Um, trying to get the guy that kept asking about the pounds. All right. So next topic here, uh, photochemical smog. Very important topic because it's going to be going through some really important pollutants and the transformations for how uh, we arrive at them. Uh, so let's get back to uh, what we're doing here. Um, I can't go into tar sands a whole lot more, um, but Taryn, if you're looking for more tar sands coverage, uh, go check out video 6.5 and partway, you know, halfway through the video, it'll go into a lot more depth there. Um, okay. That's this. Um, yeah, I know. Should I just take a break to, to get the people spamming for a second? Yeah. Let's put them in timeout. I beg, please. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, we're, we're just gonna like hang out for a second. You know, catch your breath, get a drink of water, you know, write some notes down. We'll just, uh, we'll put a few, a few people need a timeout, you know? All right, I saw a good question, Amanda. Most important calculation or equation I would say percent change just because like so many of the practice exam questions, so many of the recent FRQs, so many of the AP daily live videos have focused on percent change. So it's impossible to predict. But if I had to pick one equation, like if an AP student said, I have one equation that I can memorize by tomorrow, percent change. And it's easy. New minus old, all over old times 100. I'll put it in the chat and pin it. Um, and this is how I would write it out too, especially if you're typing on uh, the digital exam. So if you have one of the later ones, new minus old over old times 100. Let's see if I can pin that. All right, there we go. Percent change. It's pinned new minus old all over old times 100. Got to know that one. All right. Yeah, Miss Randall, I appreciate the fellow teacher uh, point out there. We need a co-host. This is what you know. John was helping me do uh, when we were hosting yesterday. Um, can we use the chemical formula of some pollutants? Uh, yes, totally. Does the subscript size matter? Jessica, this is a phenomenal question. Subscript size uh, may, or the subscript may matter. If you're talking about photochemical smog, this is a great example. You should be distinguishing between NO2 nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen oxide NO. And that's because nitrogen dioxide, which comes from vehicle emissions, primarily in urban areas, it's going to lead to photochemical smog formation, but you could totally write NO2 on the FRQ and you could totally write NO, you could write O3. So you will have definitely uh, no problem using abbreviations on the exam. The only thing you might need to be careful for is if you write NOx, NO subscript X to denote that it could be NO or NO2, you may lose a point if it had to be an NO2. And a great example here is NO2 in the presence of sunlight breaking down to nitrogen oxide and a free oxygen atom that you would need to say NO2. Uh, Lily in the chat just um, went through that there. Um, doubling time formula is just 70 divided by the growth rate. Um, I think I can throw that up at the end of the uh, video here. We've got a, a math review actually from a teacher on Facebook um, that I want to go through. So we we can look at that. Yeah, look at this. 
Um, I uh, I can't pronounce your name. I Airaria, Airaria, with the doubling time formula, 70 divided by R equals growth rate. I'm sorry I, I said your name wrong, but you're you're spot on there with uh, with that. So we're going to go back to um, kind of regularly scheduled programming here, but I'd love to take some more time at the end to focus on specific questions that keep appearing in the chat. So we will move on to some of other uh, important diagrams, but we'll circle back to some of these things in the chat here. So hang on to your question if it doesn't uh, get answered. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, I love that you guys are just answering your own questions in the chat. Like it's a great sign of people who are ready for the exam. Um, just keep that up. If somebody asks a question and I don't answer it, somebody else hop in there and answer it. Um, oh yes, Allie. All right. There's the first shout out for one of my students in the chat. Allie gets a shout out. Um, she's always doing her ed puzzles. And yeah, thanks for showing up. Oh, I saw Kimmy too. Kimmy was here, definitely. So oh, it's, it's good to see some familiar faces in the chat. Um, so thanks for showing up, guys. Okay, 8.4, big, big unit here, water pollution. 16 topics, we can't go through them all. So I had to pick a couple diagrams that I thought were super critical to understanding. One, how do humans impact wetlands and mangroves? Two, how can we mitigate? reduce those impacts. Mitigate is a big word that means reduce. Um, recognize it because it's likely that it'll be on the exam in some way, shape, or form. So when we look at these diagrams here, the first one I want to focus on is the bottom left. So we have the river, we have the estuary, another good vocab term. It's where the river meets the ocean. Mix of salt and fresh water, typically a really productive habitat. Uh, it's bringing a lot of sediments, it's getting a lot of sunlight. So back to the NPP question, that's why NPP is so high in these estuaries. You get a ton of sunlight, it's really open. Uh, you have a mix of fresh and salt water, so you have a really wide species diversity. And then you have a ton of sediments coming from all of the upstream you know, ecosystems that the river is carrying into the estuary. But what happens to disrupt them? We have an algae bloom here, and that's happening from nutrient pollution. Nutrient pollution is nitrogen, phosphorus that comes from either, you know, livestock operations, so it could from a CAFO, could come from wastewater treatment plants if they're not properly, uh, you know, treating their water, uh, it could be coming from golf courses, homes, basically anywhere that we have fertilizers being applied. Um, so that's going to get into the water, those excess nutrients cause a huge algae bloom, it covers the surface of the water, and that's going to limit visibility, it's going to limit sunlight. But then what happens is when the algae die, bacteria break it down. And now we have anaerobic, or in this case, aerobic decomposition using up all the oxygen dead zone. So that's a big problem that can happen as a result of this runoff here. So what are some solutions? Um, when we look at this top diagram here, this top diagram has a bunch of solutions. We have cover crops. If farmers are going to plant cover crops, it's going to retain nutrients. It's going to prevent so much runoff. It's going to keep the fertilizer um, in the soil, in the biomass that's growing there in between seasons. You can just, you know, put green manure on your field by chopping down the cover crop, leaving it there. Now you have fewer nutrients because you have less runoff entering this body of water. The other thing uh, that you can do is you can have enhanced nutrient removal. You could have a lot of tertiary treatment. Tertiary treatment in a wastewater treatment plant is where you have specific chemical filters that are removing nitrate levels, uh, that are lowering nitrate levels, lowering phosphate levels. Because a lot of that comes out in, in the secondary treatment where the bacteria, the microbes are, are digesting it all, again, through aerobic decomposition, we're adding oxygen, bubbling tanks. But if you add tertiary treatment and you know beyond just disinfectant with, with UV light to, to kill your E. coli or your pathogens, you can add this tertiary treatment, which will, again, filter out some of the nitrogen, filter out some of the phosphorus. Now we have less of it going into the river. Um, then we can look at, you know, just septic tank and you know, kind of land management practices where schools, homes, golf courses are putting less fertilizer on their lawns, or they're doing it in a timed manner where they look and make sure it's not going to rain before they apply it. Maybe they're using more organic, slow release fertilizers. 
Manure is a great example. Green manure, chopped up plant remains. Um, so a ton of ways that we can mitigate the effects of runoff. Riparian habitats, another big one, letter B. Um, shout out to anybody from GRP who went and did water quality testing. Um, just a couple hours ago, we were out at Buck Creek, which is our local tributary of the Grand River. And we were looking at the riparian habitat there and kind of talking about how wide it was, how much it could soak up runoff that was going to have contaminants or pollutants there. All right. Um, I got to stop looking at the chat. You guys are crazy. All right. Uh, let's go on here to mangroves. Mangroves are a very important ecosystem. So uh, let's take a look at them here. Um, yeah, for the 50th time. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Oh, not, not Buck Creek, Ben. Buck Creek. Come on now. Um, uh, example of volatile organic compounds. Uh, gasoline. Gasoline comes from, from gas stations. And also, you know, laundromats, detergents. Basically, if you can smell a compound, it easily volatilizes into a gas. Uh, nail polish remover is another great example. Acetone. Um, that's where the V comes for in volatile organic compound. It very easily vaporizes and enters the atmosphere. So remember V for vapor. Um, so a couple questions there we can, uh, get in. Um, yeah, there is some immaturity, but, uh, <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. You gotta watch out max or you're going to be banned for that kind of language. Anyway, um, let's see. Oh gosh. All right. You guys, <laughs> all right. We're going back to mangroves here. Um, definitely adding a chat moderator in the future. Okay. So mangroves, very important ecosystems for a bunch of reasons. So let's look at their benefits. Mangroves are these trees that kind of grow on almost like stilt like roots where they can tolerate these partially salt, partially freshwater conditions of estuaries. You may see them if you visit uh, a tropical place like Cuba or parts of the Gulf of Mexico. You may see them down in Florida, a really diverse ecosystem. They provide shelters for a ton of or organisms. Um, they provide a hatching ground for a lot of fish that humans fish. Uh, humans pay money to go see them. So we pay tourism dollars. They filter water. They protect our homes from being destroyed if we're along the coastline. They regulate climate. They sequester CO2. There's that word sequestration again. So ecosystem services that come from mangroves are super, super valuable, um, estimated at $800 billion per year. So they have monetary value. Now, what are the threats to them? What are the things that limit their ability to do these ecosystem services for us? Um, so some of the things uh, that they do would be uh, being logged. So countries will often cut down mangrove trees for development. So they might want to build a hotel. You know, they might want to build you know, a housing development or a road or a park. Um, so cutting them down obviously removes all of the benefits. They can't do any of the things they did before. They can't protect us from storm surges. They can't be tourist attractions. They can't provide homes for fish. Um, aquaculture, especially uh, shrimp farming. Shrimp farming is a big reason globally for the loss of mangrove ecosystem. Um, another reason though is, is pollution. So we have sediment pollution. We have physical trash and garbage that can, you know, kill the species that live in these mangrove ecosystems. Um, oil, motor oil, waste, all that is going to kind of cloud the water and limit the ability of photosynthesis beneath the water, you know, damage all of these species that live in the mangrove ecosystem. So just so many benefits of mangroves and so many ways um, that we are, are threatening them and losing their benefits. All right, we are to unit nine. Unit nine is, oh, let's just do that. So greenhouse effect, super important topic, obviously, but what we miss a lot of times about the greenhouse effect, I think, is all of the different things that can happen to solar energy from Earth, uh, from the sun, when it comes into Earth. And so that's why I have both of these diagrams here to try to, you know, kind of talk through these issues here. Um, oh, I do want to stop for a second. Isabella, um, if you haven't studied um, 
people are still posting. I need to stop laughing at it so people stop doing it. If your class hasn't studied Unit 9, what would you recommend focusing on? Probably 9.4, 9.5, and 9.10. Um, 9.4 is greenhouse effect. 9.5 is insanely long. It's like everything that happens because of climate change. 9.10 is biodiversity. So critical to understand, but also it goes through everything that humans do to reduce biodiversity. So if you're throwing up a Hail Mary tonight on Unit 9 because you didn't cover it, yeah, 9.4, 9.5, 9.10. Watch those videos. Good luck. Um, unit 9 is 15 to 20% of the exam. Um, so if you are going to you know, watch something tonight, check out Unit 9. Definitely a good way to review. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, back to the greenhouse effect here. So when solar energy is coming in from the sun, it's taking the form of visible light. Oh, I mean, it's taking a lot of forms. You know, physics people here in the chat would be coming for me, but sunlight that in our context for AP environmental science is coming in as visible light. We can see it. It's represented in this diagram here. That visible light hits earth. And this is a really important step to understand. It relates to albedo, which someone else was asking about. So in this diagram, we see that sunlight coming in. It can bounce off the surface of the earth if it hits a structure or a surface that has high albedo, high reflectivity. Ice is a great example. Snow is a great example that's going to bounce a lot of sunlight right back out. So that visible light will hit the ice or the snow, bounce back out, and it has not warmed Earth in the process. When Earth gets warmed by the sun, it's because that visible light hits a surface with lower albedo, soil, blacktop, especially in urban environments, and it's converted from solar energy, uh, or from visible light, I should say, to infrared radiation. And that's where we represent it with the red arrow. So that yellow arrow, which is visible light, hits a surface with low albedo and it becomes infrared radiation. We can't see infrared radiation with our eyes. Um, we can see it with kind of imaging, but we can feel it as heat. Uh, we feel infrared radiation as heat. And so when that heat is leaving Earth's surface, what happens is in the right-hand diagram here, it's going to hit molecules in the atmosphere. Those molecules that it hits and is then redirected back down to Earth by those are our greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor is actually a big greenhouse gas. Now we're not concerned about water vapor from a climate change standpoint for a couple of reasons. Two of them I'll talk about quickly. When water enters our atmosphere, its residence time, how long it stays there is very short. It's gonna come right back out of the atmosphere shortly. Also, as the atmosphere warms up, that water vapor is going to leave the atmosphere. It's not going to stay there and accumulate like carbon dioxide does. And so water cycles through really quickly. So it is a greenhouse gas by definition. We're not concerned about it when it comes to climate change. Um, so one more time again, what we have here is a really important concept to understand. Greenhouse gases heat the earth because the infrared radiation traveling out of Earth's atmosphere hits them, greenhouse gases, and it is shot back down to earth. Some of it is radiated out of Earth's surface, um, out into space, that's why we see it leaving all sides of these molecules, but the part that comes back down to earth is the part that's going to warm the planet. So um, let's go on here to uh, the final diagram set that I have here. And then what I'll do is go through a couple kind of just pieces of advice I have for you guys. Um, I'll try to catch up and answer a few things in the chat. I'm going to actually show um, a different uh, presentation that was created by another teacher on Facebook. Um, and then we are going to talk about some of those things. So, um, anyway, here, uh, let's talk about the last part of 9.5 that I think is super important, uh, to understand. So what we have is, uh, sunlight that's, that's coming in and, and we'll start with albedo because we just left off with it, but that sunlight is hitting snow ice. And because it's so reflective, almost all of it's bouncing off. And so this is why we actually have the you know poles are so cold or the north pole one of the big reasons it's so cold i mean it also is cold because the angle of incidence angle at which the sun's rays are striking our surface is less there's more atmosphere to pass through so there's a lot of reasons but a big reason is albedo as well so when the sun's energy comes into the north pole hits all that ice and snow it's bounced back out into space and it doesn't really heat the arctic very much or or the north pole um 
when it melts, this becomes an issue because when the ice melts, it's now replaced by dark, deep blue ocean water. It's very dark in color. It has a really low albedo. It does not reflect much light. It absorbs, you know, as much as 94%. So it's heating the water, which is melting more ice, which is raising temperature further because of the low albedo water, which is melting more ice. We call this a positive feedback loop. It's really um, important to be able to understand, you know, positive feedback loops here with respect to with the Arctic, especially. Um, it can happen with permafrost too. And so the permafrost can melt, release methane. That released methane produces more warming. And so that warms up the permafrost more and it melts and releases more methane and, and carbon dioxide. So um, important things. Um, all right, um, let's get on to ocean acidification here. So in ocean acidification, a lot of students make the mistake of thinking that the warming is causing the ocean to acidify. So what's going on is it's not you know, the warming. It's not the increase in temperature that's causing acidification. It's CO2. So remember, we talked on the very first slide, carbon dioxide is dissolving into the ocean, and that's forming carbonic acid. Now, when we form carbonic acid, H2CO3, see that in the diagram, it's going to give off a free H plus ion. The problem is that H plus ion binds with the carbonate ion to form bicarbonate. And that takes the carbonate ion away from the shells of marine organisms. So again, the big mistake that a lot of people make is thinking that warming is causing ocean acidification. And it's not the warming, it's the CO2 dissolving into the ocean, forming carbonic acid, and then that makes carbonate ions less available. If you can't remember the whole H plus ion, carbonate ion, you know, link or the chemistry there, just remember that the carbonic acid leads to the limestone or the calcium carbonate shells of marine organisms breaking down. Um, they can't, you know, maintain their bodies anymore. They don't have as much as many carbonate ions. So that takes us through um, just about everything. Oh, we do have the, uh, the positive feedback loop here I was mentioning earlier. So there's, there's your uh, permafrost positive feedback loop. Permafrost thaws, because there's all of this decomposition and it's anaerobic um, or aerobic, it, it releases some CO2, but a lot of it's anaerobic and that's where the methane comes from. There's not enough oxygen to form CO2, so it's releasing methane. That warms the planet, permafrost throws more, and there we get the positive feedback loop. So you'll notice that positive feedback loops um, play a big role in the warming of the Arctic. So um, we are getting down to uh, 10 minutes to go here. And what I want to do is go through another presentation uh, that was shared with a veteran, awesome uh, goat of an apes teacher on Facebook. And that is Kristen Shapiro. Kristen Shapiro, I can look her up on Google. She's got, you know, um, a website. She's got a ton of resources, but she put together an awesome set of resources. And she said, yeah, go on your channel, share it with people. Um, send it out. So I'm going to share it right now and I'll put it in the chat and pin it. And then what we'll do is we'll go through some of the slides that I think are the most important. There's like 50. So we can't go through them all by any means, but we can look at some that I think are super helpful. Um, so let's get this into um, the chat here. And I definitely learned that we need a moderator for the chat. You guys are just, uh, it's, it's too much. So Let's see. Okay, so we have this presentation pinned. And what we're gonna do now, like I said, is kind of spend the last few minutes. All right, I just saw what is an environment, All right? That one's kind of funny. Um, but again, I need to learn to stop looking at them so that I don't reinforce the ridiculous thing. Um, okay, let's see. This is a great one. Uh, when you have to propose a solution, you will have to propose a solution on this FRQ, uh, on FRQ number two. Um, educate people. Educating people is huge. You know, telling people to change their actions because of information that you give them is, is a really beneficial thing to do. Um, so that is a way to, again, just help solve an environmental problem without this drastic overhaul, it's just, you know, public education. Um, and then taxing, you know, instead of banning something or increasing the price, which the government can't really do, it can tax things we don't like. So increase the tax on 
a new coal-fired power plant per se or a new fracking license and it could subsidize the things we do like so it could subsidize solar power it could subsidize you know a geothermal plant it could subsidize you know new biofuels so those are ways that we can kind of encourage people um one thing i want to do because i know that there were a lot of questions about it in the chat all right i see the chat though now banned slightly um let's see all right <laughs> this is too much i could not be a twitch stream guys this is uh i'm back to my original feelings about streaming and and twitch which is stay in school and get a job where you don't have to stream so um let's see here all right i want to go down to the let's just do uh, i want to go down to the legislation um so the legislation here is is an important thing because there are some uh pieces of legislation that you have to know on this exam. And so let's go through uh, some of them here. The Clean Air Act is going to regulate some key um, air pollutants. So things that you uh, have to be aware of in the Clean Air Act. NOx, ozone, SOx, carbon monoxide, lead, particulate matter. The big thing that's not here is CO2. CO2 is not an air pollutant currently. That's actually being litigated by the Supreme Court. Um, it, it's it's in court, but it's on an APES exam. Do not write about CO2 as, as an air pollutant. Um, so let's look at a couple of their pieces of important legislation. Um, Clean Water Act, it's gonna regulate how the water looks. Um, basically, it's gonna refer mostly to surface waters, and it's going to try to pinpoint pollutants that are coming from a point place. Then we have um, CITES, which is going to be the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. So we're going to be, you know, regulating the trade of endangered species internationally, trying to prevent endangered species from being traded, you know. Um, then we have CERCLA. And so CERCLA is basically going to manage what are called super funds and brownfields. It's going to give money to clean up uh, contaminated sites. All right. Um, I think the chat may need my attention here. So we've got some people that need to go. All right. Sorry. No timeouts now. People just have to go. Um, All right, let's see. So one thing I will say that's actually valuable here, and I'll try to I'll try to take a look at the chat and actually answer some some last minute questions, is the link tree. So the link tree is what you guys want. The link tree is going to be, um, it's going to have all the resources. So let me put that here. There's the link tree. I'll pin the chat. Um, I thought I booted this guy out. All right. So the link tree is now pinned. What I'll do is this 2020 exam review by Shapiro. I'll put that in the link tree. So it'll all be there. Um, all right. So um, when we uh, take a look here at a couple more pieces of legislation, uh, and then I see El Nino and La Nina. <laughs> so for El Nino and La Nina, you want to check out uh, video uh, 4.9. Um, it's not super critical. Like it wouldn't be high on my list of the last minute things to cram El Nino and La Nina. So anyway, um, I, I would look more at legislation and then just some final tips. So Montreal Protocol, you know, banning CFCs, addressing ozone depletion. Kyoto Protocol is basically like, you know, before the Paris Climate Accord. This is an international agreement that basically developed nations should try to limit their greenhouse gas emissions. We'll try to help developing nations do it. Um, just be aware of it. Um, not super critical though. Endangered Species Act only applies to the US. Um, so if you do have to name a piece of legislation in an FRQ, talking about the US, it's a great way to preserve biodiversity. Safe Water Drinking Act, big difference between the Surface Water Act here, um, or Clean Water Act, is that it's now going to look at drinking water, which is below ground oftentimes. So Safe Water Drinking Act is going to set levels of contamination that are acceptable, and it's going to protect groundwater resources more than you would see with you know, the Clean Water Act, which was um, prior to that and, and didn't quite have the same protections for consumers or for humans that we need. So I'm going to uh, look at the chat, try to answer a few last minute questions, um, but I'm going to leave you guys with this uh, exam review link tree that has a ton of these things. 
you can go through this. This 2021 exam review by Shapiro is a super great resource. Again, Kristen Shapiro, great apes teacher. Um, she's a veteran. She has great resources. So check this out as well and go through it and kind of use this for your last minute review. So um, we are going to be wrapping up here right at nine. So I'll take a look at the chat, try to touch on a last minute question or two. Um, thank you guys so much for showing up to the people reviewing uh, seriously, part of the Apes versus Everybody community. Again, thank you for being here. It's been so much fun. Um, so I'll give you a few last minute pieces of advice. Check the chat. Um, then we're going to sign off at nine and, you know, get a good night's sleep. Don't stay up all night. Get eight hours of sleep. And then if you want to cram, I would actually say do a little cramming tomorrow morning if you can. Um, get your eight hours of sleep, but then do some cramming during the day if you can. That would be my advice. Um, my other piece of advice, which is at the end of the third FRQ video that just went out, is uh, don't be overly stressed about this. Don't feel like this score is going to define you. Um, you can still be a great environmental leader someday. You could be the next Jane Goodall. Uh, you could be the next Greta. Um, you could be the next Rachel Carson. You don't have to get a five on the exam. You don't even necessarily have to pass the exam to have a meaningful uh, career in conservation or environmental science or be an advocate. And so your exam does not define you. You know, take a big breath before you go into it tomorrow. Remember that you worked hard all year and whether or not you pass this exam, whether or not you get a five does not tell you, again, your value as a student, as someone who cares about the environment, it's independent of that. So um, I'm going to take a look at the chat, try to answer a last minute question or two, but it looks like it's going too fast. So we might just be uh, calling it a night here. All right. Yeah, it's it's flying. Um, you guys are are just yeah, I, I can't even process it. So again, one more time. Thank you to everybody who's been here genuinely, legitimately reviewing apes versus everybody family i hope you guys do great tomorrow remember to think like a mountain and of course write like a scholar good luck to everybody i sincerely hope for the best scores possible but know that it does not define you and get your eight hours of sleep tonight see everybody